Uh, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, today I will be talking on conotruncal anomalies. And uh, actually, conotruncal anomalies includes a group of disorders, and uh, an example of which is phallostetrology. So, to begin with, I will be telling you what exactly we understand by conotruncal anomalies. Uh, what is this conus or infundibulum? It is a segment that connects the great arteries to the ventricle. So potentially each ventricle can have a complete uh, infundibulum or a muscular funnel. So conus actually is a cone, muscular cone. And then we have malformations of the infundibulum and the related great arteries including an anomalies of the distal or sub semilunar part of the infundibulum, they are all categorized as conotruncal anomalies. So in a normal heart, there is a subpulmonic infundibulum, but there is no subaortic infundibulum. And therefore, we have aortic mitral continuity, fibrous continuity. And this also causes pulmonary tricuspid discontinuity. So what happened to the subaortic conus? During the course of development, it probably got reabsorbed. And there is a role of the neural crest migration in the resorption of the subaortic conus. Now, in general, when we look at the outflow of the ventricles, the outlet of the ventricles has three parts. One anterior or the parietal free wall, the posterior septum, which is the ventricular infundibular fold, which separates the two arterial valves. And in normal hearts, on the left side, some part of the ventricular infundibular fold gets attenuated, and therefore you have mitral aortic valve fibrous continuity. On the right side, the ventricular infundibular fold persists and therefore you have pulmonary valve to tricuspid valve discontinuity. So as far as the conus is concerned, there will be four combinations. In a normal heart, you will have subpulmonary infundibulum and you will have the aortic valve to atrioventricular valve continuity. The other example is the transposition of great arteries, the transposition where you will have subaortic infundibulum and you will have pulmonary valve to atrioventricular valve continuity. Then you have double outlet right ventricle where you have bilateral infundibulum there is no continuity between the semilunar and the atrioventricular valve. Then double outlet left ventricle, where both the infundibulum, bilateral deficient infundibulum, and therefore you get bilateral semilunar atrioventricular valve continuity. This is a diagrammatic representation of the infundibulum. This is a normal heart where you have subpulmonic infundibulum and uh, the subaortic infundibulum is partially deficient. Then this is transposition of great vessels where you have subaortic infundibulum but no subpulmonic infundibulum. Then you have bilateral infundibulum as you will see in DORT. And complete absence of uh, infundibulum as you will see in double outlet left ventricle. So what is the significance of this conus? So when the conus is absent, the semilunar valve that is supported by that partially absent conus becomes inferior. It is pushed downwards and sits directly over the atrioventricular valve. So the semilunar valve is pushed and the where there is a conus, 
the semilunar valve is pushed anteriorly and superiorly. And this will also determine the relative positions of the great arteries, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, etc. So the displacement will depend upon the amount of corners and the alignment of the great arteries with the ventricles. Now, this is a transfer section of the base of a normal heart. You are seeing it from below. So here we have the right atrium, the left atrium with the appendage. This is the right ventricular outflow tract with the pulmonary artery and valve. And you will see the outflow is pushed superiorly and anteriorly. And caught between all these structures uh, uh, is the wedged aortic valve because it does not have a completely muscular infantibulum. It is kind of pulled downwards and gets wedged between the two atria as well as the right ventricular outflow. Now, the conal septum joins the trabecular septum at an angle. And when you have abnormal location of the conal septum, it will result in a malalignment type of VSD. It will also cause overriding of the semilunar root. And the abnormal location of the conal septum will encroach into any one of the outflows. And therefore, this will result in disproportionate size of the great artery. And the artery that is connected to the narrowed outflow becomes very, very uh, narrow or small. So, conotruncal anomalies, you have involvement of conal septum. There is process of looping. You have to understand about the truncal septum and the aortopulmonary septum. Now, the heart, as you all know, is a straight tube. During the course of development, the heart loops to the right side. So when it loops to the right side, you get the right ventricle on the right side, the left ventricle on the left side. So this is de-looping or normal. Uh, appearance. For some reason, the looping may happen on the left side. Now, this is abnormal, and therefore, you will get left ventricle on the right side and right ventricle on the left side. The next segment is the truncal and aortopulmonary septum. So, this constitutes the outflow part, and this is the involves the septation of the bulbus, the truncus, and the distalmost part, which is the aortic sac. So this is the interventricular septum muscular. This is the membranous septum. This is the outflow of the ventricle. The proximal part, you have the bulbus, which is divided by the bulbar ridges into two. Beyond that, you have the truncopulmonary septum. There also there are ridges and which divides the aorta and pulmonary artery. But when the bulbar ridges fuse, they fuse in this plane and they go down to meet the endocardial cushions which form the uh, atrioventricular valve. However, over this you have the truncopulmonary septum or the cushion. Now, these fuse in a spiral manner and therefore, and uh, it results in the formation of the aorta and pulmonary artery. Because of the spiral septum, the aorta and pulmonary artery are twisted around themselves. And then the distal part is the aortic sac with the arch vessels. We won't go into great detail. So, aortopulmonary septum divides the proximal arterial trunk, fuses with the ridges of the cushion, dividing the outlet component of the heart, that is the bulbar ridges. So, most conotruncal anomalies have 
micro deletions of 22q11 chromosome now this particular chromosome interferes with when there is a micro deletion it interferes with neural crest migration and therefore there is inadequate migration of cells from the cardiac neural crest this causes poor development of conotruncal and aortopulmonary septum and you have syndromes associated with this like catch 22 charge etc so all conotruncal anomalies you have to know about the development of the heart tube the formation of great arteries on outflow track the aortic arches and all this the major part that is the formation of great arteries and outflow track is related to the distal bulbus the truncus and the aortic sac so all conotruncal anomalies have a certain anatomic feature in common and that is abnormal development of conus and it is many of them are related to the micro deletion of 22q11 chromosome which is associated with neural crest migration which causes poor development of the aortopulmonary septum now these are examples of conotruncal anomalies tetralogy of fallow double outlet right ventricle transposition and truncus so today we will look into the anatomy and physiology of fallow's tetralogy so it is a common congenital cyanotic heart disease it was actually first described by stenson and bishop in 1672 who first described the anatomic features but it was louis fallow in 1888 who correlated the clinical and pathological findings and called it la malady blue but it was only in 1945 that Glalakov, Tosig and others uh, got into the surgical management of cyanotic heart diseases with the, uh, they created aortopulmonary shunt. Then somewhere in 1954, Lily High attempted intracardiac repair. So TOF is, um, seen in 0.28 to 0.48 per thousand live births and among all the congenital heart diseases it constitutes 3.5 to 9 percent so and big studies like the baltimore washington studies have shown that it constitutes 6.8 percent of congenital heart disease it is believed to the, be the fifth most common defect now tof Tetralogy of fallow can show some variation. Most commonly, TOF is associated with pulmonary stenosis. About 20% TOF will be with pulmonary atresia. Sibling recurrence is known and parents with TOF, their offsprings have also a higher chance of developing fallow tetralogy. So because it is seen in families across generations, many people believe that there is an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance or an autosomal recessive mode of inheritance. We are not sure. And there are probably multifactorial causes and, and probably heterogeneous modes of inheritance. So there are syndromes associated with TOF like DeGeorge syndrome, velocardiofacial syndromes. All of them have micro deletions of the 22Q11 chromosome. There are variations in the size of the deletion, etc. Allegheny syndrome, which has jagged one gene coding for cell surface protein, 15% of Allegheny syndrome have phallotetrology. Now, what is the morphogenesis of Fallot's tetralogy? Way back in 1875, Von Rokitansky believed that it is due to malceptation of the uh, trunks. In 1970, Van Prague thought it was due to 
incomplete growth of the subpulmonary infundibulum. The infundibulum was either too short, too narrow, too shallow, etc. But what is now believed is that it is an abnormal conotruncal development. There is incomplete rotation and faulty partitioning of the conotruncus during septation. And there is small alignment of the outlet and the ventricular septum with straddling of the aorta over the mal aligned VHA. So, phallostetrology consists of a VSD, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, aortic override, and right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, basically, what happens is that the outlet septum gets deviated anteriorly and cephalar. And the degree and nature of this deviation will cause severity of subpulmonic obstruction. It will be related to the severity of subpulmonic obstruction. So, as I told you, there is a diverse anatomic spectrum ranging from pulmonary stenosis to pulmonary atresia to even absent pulmonary valve. So this is the external view of the heart with phallostetrology, classically described as a boot-shaped heart. Now this is a diagrammatic representation of what really happens. This is the normal heart and this is the conal septum. In phallo, this conal septum gets deviated anteriorly and superiorly, leaves a VSD, a gap, which is a malalignment type of VSD. So the VSD is a malalignment perimembranous defect, generally large and non-restrictive. The anterior margin is formed by the outlet septum and the anterior limb of the trabeculo septum marginally. <coughs> the floor is formed by the crest of the ventricular septum and part of the trabeculo septum marginally. The roof is formed by the leaflets of the overriding aortic band leaflet. Posterior inferiorly, you have fibrous continuity between the mitral valve, aortic valve and tricuspid valve. Sometimes you may get a thin rim of muscle, then you will not get tricuspid valve, aortic valve continuity. So here is an example. All these are examples of phallostetrology. This is the deviated outlet septum. This deviated outlet septum should have been filling this gap. And because it has got deviated, it produces a malalignment type of VSD. And it has produced a narrowing of the right ventricular outflow. So this is the subpulmonary infundibulum. Here is the os infundibulum. And then you will have a small infundibular chamber. Through this VSD, you can see the overriding aortic valve. This is the same. You will see part of the aortic valve cusp. Here again, it is a phallostetrology, a malalignment VSD, a deviated infundibular septum, the os infundibulum, a very narrow opening leading to the infundibular chamber. But here you have a muscular ridge separating the tricuspid valve from the aortic valve. Now, this is a remnant of the ventricular infundibular port. This is a closer look. Uh, this is the deviated outlet septum anterior and cephalar, the narrowed right ventricular outflow, the os infundibulum, and this is the VSD. Here is the tricuspid valve. Now, this muscle mass should have been sitting here and uh, producing alignment, proper alignment. However, it has gone anterior and cephalar. Sometimes there is very severe hypertrophy of the right ventricular musculature. This is very markedly hypertrophy trabeculoseptum marginalis. Here is the VSD and here is the os infundibulum. Very, very narrow. Another example of a narrowed os infundibulum with thickened endocardium around it because the blood is trying to flow through it. 
This is the VSD overriding chaotic drive. So the muscular fold, as I showed, told, showed you, is because of the vent fusion of the ventricular infundibular fold and the posterior limb of trabeculo septum marginalis. Some variations that you can see are, these are very rare. You can get juxta arterial defects. You can get inlet type of membranous defects, AV canal kind of defects, and rarely a restrictive VSD because of redundant valvular or accessory valvular tissue. Now, this is a VSD with accessory valvular tissue which will produce some obstruction. This is the deviated infundibular septum and the narrowed infundibular chamber. Uh, this is the left ventricular aspect of the case of fallow. Here is the VSD. It is a subaortic VSD. There is mitral aortic continuity. And here you can see the aortic to tricuspid valve. There is some accessory valvular tissue also, continuity between them. The aortic override to some extent is also caused by the rightward deviation of the aorta. The aorta during the development moves a little right and anterior. The sinuses are deviated. Therefore, you get aortic override along with the malalignment VSD. Now, how do you decide how much is the override? We decide according to the proportion of leaflet supported by the RV and LV. Now, there is some controversy between how much, what is DOF, TOF and what is DORV. Many people believe if there is more than 50% override of the aorta, you would like to call it a DORV with a subaortic VSD. But as morphologists, we look for mitral valve, aortic valve, continuity in cases of fallow. In cases of DORV, there will be mitral aortic valve discontinuity. However, this, uh, the degree of override is of surgical significance. You call it TOF, you call it DORV. Here you see the aortic valve override almost two cusps are sitting across the VSD. So there is a significant amount of aortic override. Here again, this is the subaortic VSD in a case of fallow. And here you see a little less override, half of this cusp and half of the right coronary cusp. Again, another example to show you very significant aortic override, the whole of this cusp and much of this cusp also. So both the cusps are overriding the VSD. So very significant aortic override. The aorta is humongous. The subpulmonary infundibulum can be of variable length. It can be hypoplastic. It may be long in length but narrow. It may be absent also. And the, all this is because of the variable degree of subpulmonic obstruction because of the anterior and cephalar deviation of outlet septum. Now, all this contributes to the hypertrophy of the muscular outlet septum, hypertrophy of the right ventricular free wall, and hypertrophy of the components of trabeculo septum marginalis. Sometimes there is so much subpulmonic obstruction and hypertrophy of the trabeculoseptomarginalis. septum marginalis. It extends to the free wall and displaces also the moderator band. It can give what is described as a double chambered RV. Now the infundibulum, this is the infundibulum. It is small chamber. This is the os infundibulum somewhere here. It leads to the pulmonary valve. Uh, very often there is pulmonary valve stenosis. Pulmonary valve is generally bicuspid. Here again, you see dysplastic 
bicuspid pulmonary valve, the infundibular chamber, which is small with thickened endocardium. Pulmonary valve seen from uh, top, you can see the bicuspid pulmonary valve. There is stenosis and you can just see a slit-like opening. In majority of cases, pulmonary valve will be bicuspid with location of commissures at 3 and 9 o'clock. However, you can also have commissures at 6 and 12 o'clock position. Here are other types of pulmonary valve stenosis, a dome-shaped pulmonary valve with a small central orifice. Here again is a very small pulmonary orifice. So you can have bicuspid, dome-shaped, unicuspid, and sometimes supravalvular pulmonary stenosis. Rarely you can have absent, of, absent pulmonary valve with marked dilatation of pulmonary arteries. Then you can have pulmonary atresia with the branches being stenotic or isolated pulmonary atresia. Now, TOF with pulmonary atresia, it happens because of complete obstruction uh, uh, to the outflow. The pulmonary trunk and intrapericardial arteries may be absent. What happens is that the deviated muscular outlet septum fuses directly with the parietal wall, obliterating the ventriculopulmonary junction and the uh, infundibular chamber. And therefore, because of the um, pulmonary trunk being so atretic, pulmonary arterial supply can be variable. Here is an example. This is an aorta, which is huge. The pulmonary artery that you see here, there is pulmonary valvular atresia, and pulmonary artery is a very thin cord-like structure. There is some degree of lumen, possibly because of reverse flow through the ductus. Here you see the left atrial appendage. Again, a very thin cord-like main pulmonary artery, a very narrow pulmonary valvular orifice may be not even probe patent and an extremely attenuated infundibular chamber. Here is the VSD with the aortic overrun. Now TOF with pulmonary atresia, you can have different types. The pulmonary arteries have to receive their blood supply. So either you can have a ductus which supplies the right and left pulmonary arteries you can have aortopulmonary collateral like this or you can have aortopulmonary collaterals going to one of the lungs and from there collaterals going to the other lung. Or you can have a ductus which supplies one lung and aortopulmonary collateral supplying the other lung. Or you can even have bilateral ductus. So there are large variations in the pulmonary arterial supply pattern with, in cases of TOF with pulmonary atresia. One of the major complications that you often see in TOF are infective endocarditis. So this is an example of vegetations of infective endocarditis on the tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, as well as the main pulmonary artery. The other association is with the right aortic arch. Normally, aortic arch is left-sided, but in a significant proportion of phallus, maybe nearly 25%, the aortic arch is right-sided like this. The aortic arch is right-sided. So the first branch is the left innominate, the second is the right common carotid, and third is the right subclavian. So 25% you can get right-sided aortic arch. It is important when we are thinking of palliative procedures like putting a aortopulmonary shunt, etc. You can have uh, aberrant origin of the subclavian artery from descending aorta, etc. 
there can be coronary artery anomaly in 5% the LAD arises from the right coronary and courses along the right ventricular outflow tract. Now this is of surgical importance in repair. Or you can have a large conal branch or an accessory left anterior descending artery. In 4% you may have a single coronary artery arising and many times you have small particularly in pulmonary atresia you have coronary artery to pulmonary artery fistula. Other associated anomaly, ASD is the most common, 53% of cases. Sometimes people use the term pentology or fado. There is left-sided SVC, total anomalous pulmonary venous connections, Epstein's anomaly, then fallows with AV canal defect, Left-sided anomalies are rare. Aortic valve disease, which if you find it with fallows, it is generally acquired. Now, the diagnosis is generally by ECO, and some of these are some of the views, long axis parasternal view, which will give you an image of the large VSD and overriding aorta. Short axis view will give you the picture of the infundibulum and proximal pulmonary artery. A pical four chamber view will give you a view of the VSD, tricuspid valve, and aortic valve. And a subcostal view will show you deviation of the conal septum and the VSD. So these are this is a subcostal view of a heart which we try to cut in the uh, proper plane. And this shows you the narrowed, this is the right ventricle. And here is the narrowed outflow with the deviated septum, aortic override, and right ventricular outflow tract. Now, what happens to the flow in cases of um, Fallot's tetralogy? Most of the newborns with mild to moderate pulmonary obstruction are born. Uh, pink babies, they don't have cyanosis. <coughs> this is because the desaturated blood manages to go into the pulmonary circulation. The highly saturated blood goes into the aorta. And this is the deviated uh, obstruction. And here is the VSD with overriding aorta. Now, as the narrowing becomes more significant and the pulmonary vascular resistance falls. There is still uh, venous blood going into the pulmonary circulation, but because the resistance has fallen, some amount of the oxygenated blood also goes into the pulmonary circulation and comes back. Now, if there is very, very severe narrowing, then you have the desaturated blood, the venous blood, Finding some part goes into the narrowed uh, pulmonary circulation, but since there is a VSD, it finds an easy path and goes into the aorta. Now, the aorta also receives the saturated blood, which is 95%. Then you have this desaturated blood going, and therefore, the oxygen saturation will be around 80%. However, if the ductus closes, then you have, and there is severe stenosis. Then you have all the blood, major part, going into the uh, systemic circulation as well as the pulmonary blood flow coming into the systemic circulation. And then you will have uh, desaturated blood. These babies will be cyanotic. So clinically, mild pulmonary stenosis patient is pink and may not be as sick in the newborn state. But however, if the repair is not done, the baby tends to become cyanotic. Moderate pulmonary stenosis, again, you will have a relatively pink baby with a well-balanced circulation. However, if there is severe pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia, then it will depend upon the ductus, the collaterals. Most of the newborns have cyanosis. 
and when the PDA closes, they definitely become blue. So, hypercyanotic spells, which are related to hypoxemia, are a classical feature of fallow spectrology due to prolonged decrease in arterial saturation. And all interventions then are directed to increasing the pulmonary blood flow. So, what is the philosophy between in the management of phallus tetrosis? Phallus is often lethal if untreated. But with timely surgical intervention, you can get excellent results to begin with. But long-term results are often illegal. Ideal TOF repair should be suitable for children of all ages. It should produce a good relief of the right ventricular outflow tract and to prevent right ventricular hypertrophy. There should be complete atrial and ventricular septation and with minimal or avoid, try to avoid ventriculotomy and circulatory arrays. Uh, preservation of pulmonary valve and tricuspid valve function by ventricular contractility is also very, very important. These are all a little difficult to achieve. Palliative procedures, which were first uh, uh, described by uh, Tossig and Blagokov, the BT shunt was a vortex graph on the side of opposite to the aortic arch. When complete repair is done, the shunt is taken off or it is embolized by coils. There were other shunts attempted, Watterson, Waterston shunts, Potts shunt, However, they all cause distortion of the um, pulmonary artery and the uh, aorta. <clears throat> so, the early surgical repair was described by Lilyhai in 1955. Um, he performed a ventriculotomy and aggressively removed, relieved the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction with a trans and put a transannular patch and across the uh, pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. Uh, patients did well initially, but majority of patients developed pulmonary regurgitation. And uh, it was initially thought that this was a benign hemodynamic residual lesion. But subsequently, it was related to decreased exercise performance, progressive RV dilatation, and RV dilatation caused ventricular arrhythmias, biventricular dysfunction, and death. So, though it produced a lot of relief in the RVOT, the ventricular to me really created its own set of problems. So, because there was myocardial injury or coronary injury, right ventricular dysfunction, arrhythmias, <clears throat> all are related to the right ventricular incision. Especially when you put a transannular patch with free pul pulmonary incompetence, free backward and forward flow across the pulmonary valve. Now, this is how the transannular patch used to be done, a ventricular to me pour out all the obstructive muscles and the patch goes across the pulmonary valve into the main pulmonary artery. The current modality of repair is to minimize the ventriculotomy as far as possible. Now with the devices available, the VSD can be repaired with device closure through atriotomy. So through the atriotomy, you go into the left, right, uh, right ventricle, put a device which closes the um, uh, VSD. And then you also do uh, minimal exposure of the right ventricular outflow with excision of the muscle bundles. So you are try trying to minimize the pulmonary valve and trying uh, the right ventricular incision, the ventriculotomy, so and preserve much of the right ventricular musculature. So device closure and 
minimal exposure uh, ventriculotomy incisions are what is being tried nowadays. So this comes to the end of my talk on phallus tetralogy. And in the subsequent classes, we will be looking at other conotruncal anomalies like transposition of great arteries, DORE, etc. Thank you so much.